Yes. We'll be okay without Tom here. <laughs> all right, let's. All right, we got all this good stuff. We're we're wasting it. Oh, uh, I don't know. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, of course. Oh, Paul. You know this. There's... Literally, this discussion about index funds could be. I'm not advocating for an hour, but mm-hmm. there are so. I actually wrote an article. 30 reasons I love index funds years ago. 30? Yes. And I left some off. Paul. Oh my. Yeah. You should have left like 24 off. No. Um, All right. right. Let's start it. Let's start it. Okay. Oh my gosh. It's time again. It's two weeks. Two weeks goes by like that. It's another talking real money sound investing. Now, that's a mouthful. Or is it sound investing talking real money, Paul? You know, I have no idea and I can't talk as fast as you can. But I do know you read my book and you read you read it beautifully. Thank you. I mean, yeah, it's you, up at, Audible. It's an Audible book. Yeah, it's up Terrific. at Audible now. Yeah, but by the way, I just want to let people know. I went to Audible because yours is my first Audible book which is called We're Talking Millions by Paul Merriman and Richard the Buck. Buck. Yep. <laughs> uh, and uh, it says narrated by Don McDonald. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Click on my name and it'll show three other books by Don McDonald. Ooh. One is Sasquatch Hunter. The other is <laughs> The Tourist. And the other is something else. And it, none of those Don McDonald's are me. It's some guy oh. who goes... I stood on the side of the road. I was waiting for a car to come by. And I'm going, wait, that's not me. That's yeah. him. Yeah, no, different well, Don McDonald. He's well, a Sasquatch hunter, though. The other Don McDonald. Yeah, I, I actually one time went to a meeting where a Sasquatch hunter brought pictures of what he found. And uh-huh. they were pictures of the forest. And he pointed out all of the shadows that were the Sasquatch. I mean, uh-huh. it's it, it's like what we're talking about today, active management versus passive. You know, the active managers want to find the Sasquatch there in the forest. Right. That, uh, and, and almost anything can look like a Sasquatch in the forest. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Don McDonald. I'm one of the hosts of Talking Real Money. The other host of Talking Real Money is out uh, playing in the San Francisco Bay Area, going to Francis Ford Coppola's restaurant tonight, being all fancy, while I'm stuck here talking to Paul Merriman, the host of Sound Investing, and a good friend for many years. As a matter of fact, a man who once, back in the dark ages of... uh, Financial Talk Radio actually flew out to Colorado Springs from Seattle to just take me to lunch. It's the weirdest mm-hmm. thing ever. Changed my life. You were and young. yours. And yours. It changed in a my way. I t- I changed, I changed, <laughs> totally changed my life. My gosh, I ended up working for Paul for many years. And uh and and really, I truly, by the way, Paul, before we get into our topic, which kind of relates, when my show was in its heyday, the Don McDonald show on Business Radio Network. I was, at that time, and I told everybody this, I was a believer in active management. Mm -hmm. I thought that a good manager, because I'd been a stockbroker like you, I thought a good active manager could add return, could actually add some intelligence and some foresight and make people more money. Your work, a lot of your research that you did on dimensional funds and factor investing was responsible for me coming 100% around to the concept of passive or index investing on the radio. You know, Don, I I, I want to just correct one thing you said. It was not my research. I shared it with everybody. I still share it with anybody who will listen. But it is really the research of Dr. Fama and Dr. French and a whole bunch of academics who have taken the understanding of investing a whole lot deeper than you and I ever got exposed to when they were training us to go into the trenches to sell securities. It had nothing to do. Yeah, and speaking of that, speaking of the trenches, do you read the latest news on Merrill Lynch? No. That they have totally eliminated cold calling 
from their uh, their trainee program, their three year trainee mm -hmm. program, where they're training. They're not really training them. What they're doing is they're testing them and they're throwing out ninety nine percent of them to find that one percent who are the best salespeople to become the big deal Merrill Lynch brokers. Well, when I went into the industry, uh, I started a, a, a applying when I was 19 and getting ready when I came out of college to go to work for a brokerage firm. I thought that'd be a great place to meet really smart people and people who had done well in their careers. And what I was told was, uh, even when you come out of college, we're not interested in you until you go out and you sell something. We don't care if you sell fuller brushes. We want you to have the experience of selling something because that is what this business is about. And uh, as luck may I may oh. I may I add to that anecdote? I was uh, I did not come out of college with uh, with all of this economic knowledge, but I spent all of my twenties or most of my twenties, well, all of my twenties, selling appliance parts, selling mm. car service and car parts and tires, selling stereos and televisions at J.C. Penney, and boy, was Dean Witter interested in me. Yeah, and the and I think Don the point is back then, and things have changed a lot. Back then, there was no such thing as a registered investment advisor who was helping people who only had 50000 or only had 100000 or only had 10000 We were all stock jockeys. We yep. were taught that if you had a portfolio of 10 to 15, maybe 20 stocks, you had all the diversification you would ever need. And, and, and so it was totally different than what we have today, because while a lot of people, in fact, somewhere in your collection, you have a hat that represents the difference between what was perceived to be in the best interest. What does that hat say? That hat says, yes, merely suitable, merely suitable. And basically what we did in that business was make recommendations that were suitable. Today, the good guys or the good people are wearing the hat that says your best interest. And that is the fiduciary responsibility. And it is from what Don and I both know night and day in terms of what's in your best interest. But Paul, back in, our, in the day, you're a little older than I am, but back in the day, we were told that uh, that active management, that that the research department at our firms had the skill set to be able to pick stocks. And it wasn't until really into the 80s that the teachings of guys like John Bogle and some of the work of Fama was starting to work its way into the to the to the environment. What changed? What got people involved and why is active management bad and indexing better? Well, I think I think obviously John Bogle was responsible for starting the first index fund and and it took years when I came into the investment advisory business in the early 90s. It still was not perceived anywhere close to what it is today because indexing was the S&P 500. That was it. If you were talking indexing, you were talking about one index. And of course, as you and I were growing together and understanding more and more about this, it turned out you didn't need any of the active managed funds in your portfolio. You could do everything with index funds. As a matter of fact, one of the great, uh, what would we call myths, I guess, of indexing is one that came out of the active management uh, arena. And that is when they finally realized they were losing money to the S&P 500. And that, of course, was still indexing. They said, look, mm -hmm. that was yes. the, that was it. That was yes. the only product. Put your money into the S&P 500. That's your basic position. But around the edges, what you need to do is to beef up your portfolio with some of these higher achievers. Well, today... We have those higher achievers like small cap and small cap value and mm -hmm. large cap value. You don't have to go outside of the arena of indexes to get to those extra little things you would want to put around that 
basic S&P 500 index. But for a very long time, folks like John Bogle and many others like him said, there's really no need for anything other than a, an S&P 500 index. What changed? Well, I think the work of Fama in French probably caused a lot of that change. And what they did was they made the case for what we now refer to as factor investing, but they made the case for other very different asset classes other than large cap blend. That is what the S&P 500 is part of. As a matter of fact, Don, as I was thinking about this discussion this morning, I just took a look at the S&P 500 index at Vanguard to see how is their performance compared to their category average performance. And what was interesting to me is the category is not the S&P 500. The category is one the Russell 1000. So it's 1,000, not 500 uh, uh, stocks that are being used as the benchmark if you go to Morningstar to see how the S&P 500 is doing. So the S&P 500 could be underperforming its benchmark, even though most of us consider that to be the benchmark. It could. And, and, And when you look at the category returns, you do see years. You do see years where the S&P 500 has appears to have underperformed. Not very often, by the way. But the other thing I think is so fascinating is when you go into Morningstar, And you look at a fund like the S&P 500, and it shows, for example, over the last 10 years, it was in the top 20%. Well, I don't quite understand that because I've seen so much evidence that the S&P 500 is in the top 10% until I realized that what they're reflecting in the Morningstar results is the results of all of the funds that still exist. It doesn't include the funds that are gone, have merged oh, away or closed. And so if you course. go out 50 survivorship. years, survivorship, and according to the to SPIVA report, uh, Standard look, and Poor's stand- Index versus Active. Exactly. Over a 15-year period, the... S&P 500 does beat 90%. So there's really, you can get confused as to what's the real story. Well, the real story is with an index, you damn well get what you pay for. You get it at a low price. And 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 you're probably going to end up in the upper 10% of all investors. But one of the things people ask, and they ask often, you hear it, I hear it, is, well, why do I just want to be average, Paul? There are guys out there claiming, you know, you got Jim Cramer saying, I've always beat the uh, S&P 500. You got all these folks claiming that they've beaten the S&P 500 over time. You got hundreds and hundreds or not thousands of active fund managers who claim that. Uh, Hedge fund managers, what are they lying to me? Some are. Let me give you an example of one that I know lied to the father of a good friend of mine that that uh, still works at the Merriman uh, Management Company. His father was told by his stockbroker that his performance had outperformed the S&P 500 for the last 10 years. What he didn't include in his analysis were the dividends that were paid within the S&P 500 because the index itself does not reflect the impact of uh, of the dividends that are paid and then reinvested. When you look at the returns on Morningstar for a S&P 500 fund, it does include the uh, dividends reinvested. So there's I'm an going example. To, I'm, I'm going to sneak off with an aside here, by the way, because... Uh, we, I, we, you and I had been talking about indexed annuity salespeople earlier mm. before we started. Um, I hate them, by the way, all of them, pretty much with a white hot passion. Uh, but I went to a steak, a couple of steak dinners where they were pitching indexed annuities, 
And that is exactly what they do in their pitch. They mm. show you a chart of the S&P 500, the number itself, the index number, not the S&P 500, including dividends. And they'll show you all of this horrific volatility and show you how their index annuity would have eliminated that. But they show you losing money over all these pe long periods of time when, in fact, you wouldn't have lost money yeah. over a long period of time had you factored in the dividends. There's a famous uh, song where it includes the line, you got to know the territory. You remember? What was that from? That was, I, you, oh my oh, God. Oh, 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 that was from um, uh, Music Man. Music Man, yes. You, you gotta I know. should know that because I did that show. Ooh. In fact, that was my part, the got to know the territory guy. You mean you what sat there that? and you went. I, on the, on the, yeah, <laughs> I was the salesman. <laughs> Gosh, what was his name? Oh, when uh, we were young, huh? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, so, but there's a whole bunch of ways that that we get misled. That word "average." Here's the beauty: Morning Star is here to help us. They may not be perfect, but they are here to help us because, yes, they show the average return of adv managed funds, actively managed funds, and it turns out that the average return of the actively managed fund is way below the index. So the index is not average. And what people think is that the average return is something higher than, than the index because that's what they've been told by salespeople. Not so. And once you learn how to use Morningstar, you'll be able to ferret that kind of stuff out. And, and the reason I think it's important it's because I contend that indexing is the most dependable, the most dependable way to invest. And the more you dig and the more you know, not only do I think you'll agree with me, but you'll be able to say, it's dependable. I trust it. I don't ever have to talk to another security salesperson in my life. And that's not because they're bad people. They happen to be in an industry that sells an inferior product. And you simply need to find that out for yourself. I was Charlie. That's who I played. Charlie. He's a fake and he doesn't know the territory. Look, what do you talk? What do you talk? Yeah, remember that, that the one? Yes. Yeah. 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 I just know. Oh my uh, God. Okay. Well, let's talk about index, indexing for a minute. S&P 500. 500 biggest companies in the United States. For, for many years, it was the way to index. Yes. But it's not the way to index anymore, right? It's not, not the only. That's right. Well, is it the right way? Is it the best way? Is it a good way? It's a good way for a lot of people who would find the S&P 500 represent companies they have a good sense about. It's like Peter Lynch once said something about you should invest in companies, you know, you go into a mall and you see companies and they're Sears and you should invest in Sears. And I mean, <laughs> we know Sears. not well, Sears. Okay, he got one wrong. But but yeah. the, <laughs> but the bottom and remember, by the way, one of his biggest in in terms of profit investments he ever made was a failing Chrysler. So uh, it, it, it 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 there is always a little more to the story. But people mm -hmm. do know those names. And what's fascinating to me, and this was in the book, uh, Your Money and Your Brain by Jason Zweig. One when of the he's, best. It's a great book. He talks about this home bias. And he, the book was written decades ago, I think. And, and, and what he used as examples was in Greece, and in New Zealand, two very small markets, investors in those countries had over 90% of their money in their home country. And we have mm -hmm. the same bias here. And in fact, there's a one great study that he refers to where he compares the expected rates of returns of Germans versus Americans and Americans versus Germans. And the Germans who were surveyed believe that Germans made 2% more per year than Americans make as investors. And the Americans who were surveyed believe that Americans make 2% more 
more than the Germans per year. We are all nuts. And if you read his book, you will understand why it is so important to figure out how to get around all the nutty things that we're likely to be trapped by because they're just regular human emotions. Well, that you just got to the point I was trying to get to. The S&P 500 is investing in the United States. A lot of people in the United States, we get it all the time, uh, you know, back, let's say, the 1990s when the U.S. market was really, really, really hot. Everybody bought U.S. stocks. So if you bought the S&P 500, you were doing well in the 90s. But if you held the S&P 500 from 2000 to 2010, you actually, even after dividends, lost money. However, if you also had an international index mixed in with your U.S. index and you split that, say, half and half over that same 10 years, you made almost 7% per year. And also so there's more. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and there's small cap value and large cap value. Uh, there's REITs. There, there were emerging markets, which are international, but they're a different asset class and 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 require different indexing in in theory. Yeah, there is so much more, Don, and and the challenge is for investors. If there are so many more, how do we decide to put there all these? There you go. And that's what we're all struggling with. You're struggling with it. I'm struggling with it. How do we do it? in the best interest of each investor. But human nature being what it is, we want to be in the index that's going to do the best in the future. And we confuse that term, going to do the best, with doing the best, which is actually had has done the best. Yeah, and, and it's, there's a challenge here, Don. I happen to be, and I think you are too, a fan of having some small cap value in the portfolio. And the good news is that over the last 90 plus years, that asset class as a group, not individually, but as a group, and index, all of the small cap value stocks. Yep. All of those stocks uh, have compounded at about 5% more per year than the S&P 500. Now, that's life-changing. And so what could stand in the way of an investor having some money in small-cap value? Well, I can, I can tell you what is, is very difficult about adding that asset class the world of, well, at least U.S. investors, they don't even talk about the Dow Jones anymore like they did when you and I were back in the in the brokerage business. It's the S&P. And thank heaven they don't. Yeah, well, that's right. But, but now it's the S&P 500. And the average difference in return between the S&P 500 and small cap value, regardless of who has a better year, the average difference is 15% a year. Well, all of a sudden, that means on average, if small cap value might underperform the S&P 500 and your neighbors are all relevant, rejoicing with their great returns, you got part of your portfolio sucking gas. And that's not good emotionally. And so- No, people hate that. Exactly. And sometimes an asset class like small cap value, just like you talked about the S&P 500 being a dog for 10 years, as a matter of fact, for 20 years, the S&P 500 underperformed uh, long-term government bonds. So what, what, what happens is you get disappointed. You don't have the staying power to be in these other asset classes unless you have figured it out and understand that even stocks underperform bonds for long periods of time. Small cap underperforms large cap for long periods of time. Now, I'm 77. How old are you, Don? You're not going to tell. 
More oh, than, uh, oh no, I know. I hear. Are you I'll actually? Are I'll you more than demonstrate? Are you this more goes, than seventy-seven this or less? This goes into effect. This goes into effect uh, in uh, June. Oh, oh you there made you it. You made it. Yeah. So. And remember those years? You never yeah. thought you'd make it. That's great. No, that I is. knew I'd be dead by now. <laughs> I know. Me too. So, <laughs> particularly when I was a teenager, I was sure I was going to be dead by now. So the the bottom line is. If people can't stay the course, somehow figure it out, trust it, trust it, then they're mm-hmm. not likely to get the advantage of stocks over bonds or small cap over large cap or value over growth. And each of us have to figure out what we trust. I'm 77. You're about 65. I, 65. 62. Almost, 65. Yeah. Okay. 65. 65. All right. Okay. Then, then. I got 12 years on you here. If I live another five years, I'll feel lucky. So Mm -hmm. should I be in small cap value if it can underperform for long periods of time? Should I be in internationals if they can underperform U.S. for long periods of time? Should you be in the S&P 500 when it can underperform for long periods of time? Exactly. So I put on my what the heck is this investing about hat. Who's this money for? It isn't to pay my bills because we're doing okay on paying the bills. It's for other people. It's for causes that are important. So even at my my in my final years of life, I still invest in equities as if I were 21. What I don't do is invest in stocks like I invested that when I was 21, because then I would be 100% in, but I'm only 50% in equities today. I got I got a lot of break going on there with the bonds, breaking the speed and the excitement of the equities. So it takes some education. But here's the thing, though. you Are you doing all of this? This is what a lot of people, i not sure they get. Are you doing all of this with index funds? Yes. Yes. But people need to understand something very important. I think a lot of people don't know this. Index funds are not all created equal. In some cases, like the Invesco S&P 500, it has a five and a half percent load. And eh. Not going to buy that one. <laughs> it has yeah. a 0.54 expense ratio. Ah, there it is. I mean, I got to get an app bell here of some sort uh, rather than do this with my. Yeah, they have oh. it on your iPhone now. You can oh, get do that they? on your phone. Okay. Just, All right. Yeah, you're going to get a buzzer. Okay. Get well, that for next time. I will. I'll be ready. But But this makes a difference. And when we talk about small cap value, there are small cap value indexes where the average size company is over $5 billion. And other small cap value indexes average about $2 billion. Does that make a difference? Well, I can tell you this year it has because those that have the average, the smaller size, they're about 7% ahead this year of those that have the larger size. Those are things you need to know. And for those of you playing along at home, there's a reason. I, there are reasons why, for example, small cap value should, over time, outperform large cap growth. One of the reasons is smaller companies have more room to grow. That's why they tend to do better, but they're more risky. Undervalued assets have more room to become valuable again, but they are more risky. It's a risk return trade off. And how do you manage that risk return trade off, Paul? Well, in, in my portfolio, what I, what I do is I have a balance of both. I've got some large and some small. And the beauty is because they do go up and down at different times, there's some value potentially to rebalancing over time so that when one is out of favor, that you would be moving money from the 
high performer, not everything, to the, the under performer, and they have a tendency over time to, to yin and yang. They're going back and forth as to who's on first base, etc. So there are some real advantages, not only in getting higher returns because of more risk, but also, my fault, my fault. A little I've been dance bad. music. I've been bad. Oh, I, didn't right. have my, I got a new phone. Okay. I can't figure out how to turn it off. I'm, 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 it's a, it's a iPhone yeah. okay. 12. I'm, I'm bragging. Yeah. It's the only thing I know about technology is I have an iPhone is 12. iPhone. I have an iPhone 12. <laughs> yes. I have anyway. whatever's the newest one. You get whatever the newest one is. I have that one. I'm a oh. techno freak. And where was but, I that I, I was breaking we, the bar- sound barrier? How somehow? No. Well, we were we were talking about how you manage these this divergent risk when you've got small cap value that's highly risky, and uh, you, you said you rebalance. And a yeah. great example of of how the power of rebalancing came this last spring, not this last spring, a year ago in the spring. That person loves you, Paul. You know. I'm- uh, Go ahead. No, there's a little there's a little button on the side right here. Flip no. it down till it shows orange. Oh, that one. Yeah, the orange yeah. button. Thank there you. you <laughs> uh in 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 March, April of 2020, when the stock market tanked, um a smart investor or a smart investment advisor would have been selling your bonds, which had done really well up to that point. And put your money into the stock market would have been smart. Yeah, yeah. There's no risk in the past. I mean, that, that's a uh, we know when we should have done the rebalancing. But yes, over time, it it does add value, particularly for old people like me who are trying to keep our risk down. But what do you do? Because nobody I know from our firm that nobody wanted to do that. What, 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 what? you're going to sell my stuff that's doing well and buy stuff that's doing badly? Can we wait to buy the stuff that's doing badly until it's going up? How do you manage that Well, I'll as an you, individual? Uh, the way I manage it is I have somebody manage my money. I mean, I, this because is- Because even you, even, even you I, find, find yourself tempted. I don't want to have to deal with tax questions. I don't want to have to deal with rebalancing questions. I don't- I, I just, I have people I trust to take care of it. I'd rather be here talking with you about helping others than ever thinking about my own portfolio. I am a very emotional person. I have always been afraid of the economy collapsing. Right. If I were allowed to, to well, manage... Well, you, you see, look out his window. He actually lives in a bunker that is just it's painted <laughs> green. <out> the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but I want I do want to correct something you said, because this is something Uh-oh. a lot of people do not know, I think. I, I fear. Why is it, I would ask, over time have the academics found that, in essence, good growth companies or that group that have done so like so well lately, how can it be that those great companies over time underproduce the out of favor companies? And the reason is from what we know about the past is that fools rush in. When I say fools rush in, I don't mean they're really fools. They're doing what humans do. When something's been doing well, they love to get on board and be there for the kill. They want to make a lot of money. It's always more fun to make money where it's passively made. I mean, where some you're just buying and selling stuff. You're not actually working. People love See Dogecoin. That's right. See Dogecoin. But what happens is those great companies don't all go to the moon. As a matter of fact, it turns out almost none of them go to the moon. If you look at the companies that have great long-term track records over decades and decades and decades, their compound rate of return is about the compound rate of return of the S&P 500. But when those really popular companies turn downward, all of a sudden, there can be a rush 
to the exits, to get out when they're not expected to be as good in the future as they have been in the past. Back in the 2000 through 2002, that bear market that just just took the air out of the balloons big time, it could fall. A company, a big, successful, popular company could fall 25% in one day because they under-earned by a penny what mm-hmm. was expected. And so there's no, that scary. risk. There, In some ways, Don, I think that successful growth companies are almost more risky for a lot of kinds of investors than the more doggy value companies. So let's get to the bottom line then of all this. To be a a proper index investor requires a lot more than just a standard and poor's 500 fund from Vanguard or Fidelity, where at least there the costs are low as opposed to Invesco. I think so. Remembering that every half a percent we add to our return, if we're young enough, it should add another million dollars to what you have to spend and to leave to others. Literally, every half a percent. That's what my my we're talking millions is is all about. But there's something. Where were have... you when I was in my twenties and thirties? Well, you, oh, you were in your forties, probably <laughs> selling stocks. Well, look. Yeah, well, I wasn't in my 40s. That's when I started our management company. When I turned 40, oh, that oh, was okay. it. But but here's what you have to do above and beyond understanding about these different asset classes. You need to turn off the noise. That noise can come from friends. I don't mean you have to reach over and tweak their nose or something. I mean, you've just got to get their talk. No, I, I find I keep I keep a handkerchief in my pocket and I just jam it in their mouth. <laughs> Such a friendly guy. More effective. <laughs> well, that's one thing. And to turn off Jim Cramer. Uh, I've met Jim Cramer. He's a nice guy. Actually, in person, he's a fairly humble kind of guy. And but but you do not want to listen to that noise if you're t- or, or CNBC. Don't even turn on CNBC, even though it is. I love it. I love to watch CNBC. I normally get up between three and four in the morning. Don't do that. I know. I love it. And I can watch uh, CNBC and I can learn things about what's going on in the economy. But I can tell you little stories start kind of trying to sneak in. And I hear, I feel myself saying, hmm, why not oh, just a little bit of money, not a penny? I have not speculated for over 40 years. And I'm proud and of you. Thank I, you. I, I have to tell you, I am the opposite. I will not turn on CNBC yep. ever because I will suffer the same fate. I will get tempted. I don't even know during the course of the day, and I'm in the financial services business, what the market is doing unless I happen to get in the car and flip on NPR at the top of the hour and they go, the market's down. You know, I, I don't know. Yeah. I shouldn't know. I don't need to know. Right? Yeah, but it's, you know, I think of young people, those are the people I really want to help. I mean, old people that I run into typically already have enough money. It's just a question of whether they handle it right for the rest of their life. But young people, I'm working on an article right now, maybe one of the most popular that I've ever written, about what would a $300 Dogecoin investment mean to a 30-year-old person uh, over the next 40 to 50, 60 okay. years. Invested properly. Invested. And I'll just tell you the bottom line. That $300 invested in a very common way, not complex, not high risk, just kind of indexing, staying the course, don't take it out, leave it in there, reinvest. It's about, it's over $250,000 between what you will spend and what you will leave to your children and charities. 250. And what's going to happen if you hit the, the Dodge coin treasure, Doge. and, and Doge Doge. Coins, and you sell it for twice what you got in or three times? Are you going to look for another opportunity like that and then lose? Or will you hit two in a row and try it a third time and then you will lose? 
That is a great message, by the way, because here's, the, here's what you're going up against, though, saying, okay, $300 today in 40 years, Mr. 20-something, uh, you'll have a quarter of a million dollars. And that Mr. 20-something, as you and I both know, having once been Mr. 20-somethings, is thinking, I may not be here in 42 years. I may be gone. But I'm looking back at when Dogecoin was four one hundredths of a cent, and now it's 40 cents. I would have made that in six months, dude. There's no risk in the past. We, in fact, in fact, I can even tell you this. I know the winning numbers of last week's lottery. Oh, we could be filthy rich, Don. I would even give you half of it as a friend. If we go back and do it over again, yeah, yeah, it'd be nice. Why don't we do that? I can't tell you how many times I've sat with a with a couple. And one of the couple will not let the other one forget that in 1986, I told him he should put some money in Microsoft. Yeah, sure. My wife to this day, remember back when uh, when Apple had come back with Steve Jobs, my wife bought some Apple stock when he came back to the company and and he died. And I said, geez, you know, they've done so well. I don't know how they can do a lot better. She goes, you think I should sell the stock? I said, I don't want you to own individual stocks at all. So she goes, but to this day, she looks back at Apple and she goes, you told me to sell. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would, it may be a reason rich. for a divorce. I'm not sure, but, well, but, but it's unfair. I, it's unfair. I did that one time, <laughs> not four, but one. Uh, at, at, okay. I got one more question though, before we have to wrap this up. Cause we don't, we, we, we promise people reasonable links. When you're going out to index invest, it used to be that you would go to Vanguard, uh, sometimes maybe Fidelity, yeah. and that was it. And you put your money into one of their open-ended mutual funds. Mm -hmm. Today, we have many things that are index products, but they're not mutual funds. They're ETFs. What should Oof. investors do now? Well, I think ETFs are 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 great. Uh, and by the way, so does Vanguard. Vanguard has moved a lot of their mutual fund investors into ETFs. So uh, it, it eventually, I think they'll try to move most of their investors into ETFs where you can make investments of as little as $100 uh, or $1,000. Actually less, because some of the brokers are doing fractional shares of yes, ETFs now. Yes, Yeah, it's amazing. Um, as a matter of fact, this summer, Dimensional Funds, a company that moves glacially, yes. is converting three of their bigger mutual funds directly in to ETFs, exchange-traded funds. So you're good with that. I, I think it's, I am good with that uh, for tax reasons, for one thing, but I am not good for it if what people are going to do is to use the greater liquidity and the fact that you can trade these things without a commission uh, as, a, as, as a reason why you should get into the day trading business. I am not a fan, nor was John Bogle a fan, of using ETFs for trading. Uh, but as a long-term hold, I I think they're tremendous. Now, by the way, just for those who haven't dealt with these, when you bought when you buy open in mutual funds, you buy them at the price of the previous day at the after the close of business. And you pay that price, the price of the total portfolio. ETFs are a little bit different, and you need to bear this in mind. They're they're very, very good with for ETFs with huge floats, but there is a bid and an ask. Yep. So there is a spread. Uh, it works out great long-term, but if you do want to move them short-term, that bid and ask is in essence, it acts as, uh, as a commission of sorts. It, it certainly is an expense. The spread. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and so, and some places you also have to pay a commission on top of that. But it's becoming very common now that you're able to buy ETFs. Uh, we have an ETF, what we call best in class, that uh, we give people who want to be ETF investors on their own. I think it's also important to know that when you are a mutual fund owner, 
and particularly underneath the umbrella of an IRA or a 401k. When you sell, you get the, in essence, the bid or the ask or the mean between the bid and ask, or in essence, everybody who buys and sells at the end of the day or right after the close, in essence, they get mm-hmm. the same price. So you are trading without any spread, without any commission. So there mm-hmm. are people who it does make sense uh, to stay in the mutual fund environment. Plus, if you got ETFs, you can trade them any time of the day that the market's open. One more decision. When do I do it? Not only which ones do I get, when do I get them? How much should I have in each one? You do it when you rebalance and you do it when you need the money. Those are the only two reasons you do anything. Now, before we go, yep. fast index, your biggest fact or important consideration when it comes to investing in indexes? Control and dependability. You control what you have. You, you can get into an actively managed fund. And what was a small cap fund can become a mid cap fund or a, a, a large cap fund. And if, if in fact the academics are right and the selection of asset classes are the biggest decision, most important decision you make, then you want to control that. And that control extends to the expenses that you pay. That control extends to the taxes you pay. You will never have as much control at, at as little cost in the investing process as you will in working with indexes. And if you can't, if you can't do it, I just talked to a lady on the phone who cannot pull the trigger herself. And so if she's going to do it right, she's going to have to let somebody else pull it. But I don't want that person pulling a trigger on anything but an index fund. So that's Mm -hmm. the control that you can have is don't let whoever you're going to hire to help you do anything but use index funds or ETFs. That's that's how I feel. Paul, it is always a pleasure spending time with you every couple of weeks. I really enjoy this. Thank you, Don. Uh, I did too. PaulMerriman.com, right? Yes. People can write you, Paul at at PaulMerriman.com. That's how you get me. And you run the Merriman Educational Foundation. Yep. You got podcast galore at your website. Yep. Sound Investing. Or you can find them on a podcast service. 400. Wow. Wow. And so go check them out at paulmerriman.com or on your favorite podcast service. I'm Don. Tom will be back with us in Good. a couple of weeks. Good. Um, you can, if you have questions for me or us at Talking Real Money, just go to talkingrealmoney.com and uh, you can type them up or speak them on our contact form there. And uh, we're always open to some ideas for a show too, aren't we? Sure. All Absolutely. Right. That's good. That's good. No, no, no. We're going to try and do these every two weeks and they'll uh, go up both at Sound Investing and at Talking Real Money. So yeah. we thank you so much for being a part of it. We are so glad you're out there. Hope you'll tell a friend or two or many. Yep. Uh, and by the way, if you really like our podcast, our audio podcast, go to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. Yeah. They really do help. They not only make us feel better when they're good. They make us feel bad when they're bad. Uh, we get over it. But they also do help build our audience. And, and by the way, Don. To get this message. Yeah, I, yeah, and I want to mention something. A lot of people in the industry that we're in with the podcast and the video business, and I'm not being critical, but they're into building an audience partly because they have monetized their business by being able to sell things and, and, and so – the more people that follow them, the more money they make. And I don't, that's capitalism at work. So that's, that's not evil. But the fact is, the work that, that we're doing, we don't have any ads. We have one affiliate program uh, on our site. Okay, we're, we're, that's Paul, but that's not us. You don't we have actually have ads because we're, we're, ca- we're bigger capitalists than Paul. Oh, you have you have ads for you mean for your On our serv- for your services. Yeah, for our service, but, for Vestry. Yes. All right, right. So anyway, the process is one of educating 
whether it's for do-it-yourselfers or for people mm-hmm. who are looking for an advisor, it's the same end result. We want you to do better. Good luck. We want you to have a great future. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, I'm Paul. Don McDonald. Have a great day, whatever it is. And we'll talk to you again really soon. Take care.